we empathize or you know we are trained to empathize we are still connected but we are connected digitally we don't only get the patient involved does technology help to bridge communication i think yes i hope that one day dialysis can be made more pleasant to patients my journey it is a lot of hard work <laughs> Welcome to Anderson YouTube channel. Today, our guest is a remarkable personality who carved away from a nurse in a dialysis center to a director and product owner of Freenal Works, a team of passionate professionals who digitalize dialysis clinics. Please welcome Jamie Matthews. Jamie, thanks for taking the time today to talk with me and our audience about the renal patient care and digital health in Asia. Hi, Elena and the team from Anderson. Thank you so much for having me today. Jamie, to get started, your career path is nothing short of fascinating, starting as a nurse and eventually becoming a director. Please tell us more about you becoming a clinic administrator and then an IT manager and product owner. Wow, that, that actually begins way back in the 19, 1990s. You kind of make some calculation and you basically will know uh, my age then. It started off uh, as a nurse and from there I have worked with um, hospitals, primarily from hospitals and then from hospitals I then graduate to standalone dialysis centres and then from there I actually took interest in software. There's a story behind it actually. There was this day in Sometime in the year uh, 2000, there was like five years into nursing when I'm very much into uh, dialysis. And the, then the owner of this uh, dialysis facility has actually started creating their own uh, in-house software. And during that journey, what he did was he says, you know, Jamie, come here. I have something for you to look at. These are the datas. Do you think you're able to work out something with that? So at that point of time, you know, throughout this nursing journey of mine, what I've done is that we have every, documented everything on paper. And when I saw that moment of data on that screen, it was actually an epiphany moment for me. And that was the driving force from then onwards until where I am. Uh, today. Uh, basically, I no longer practice, but what I have done is that from practicing, I have that knowledge and that experience, and then from that experience has made me become, I hope, uh, a better product owner. That's the journey. <laughs> That's great. Do you have an IT project? Anderson will do everything to launch it as soon as possible. Strengthen your resources with our specialists. Hire a well-coordinated, dedicated team or entrust the entire development process to us. Getting started is easy. Fill out the contact form to get a free consultation. What an amazing journey. Did you intentionally plan your career the way it has unfolded or did this path come as something unexpected for you? Well, you know what, it, it, is, it is actually not, uh, not expected. I, I mean, I, I thought that, um, you know, in my early days uh, in, in, in nursing, when I started nursing, I think I, I didn't want to just practice nursing. I, I wanted to grow and be in lecturing and etc. But I think, that, that moment becomes uh, different after studies and after a lot of experience when that opportunity was uh, given to me, whereby it was, it was mentioned that, Jamie, can you become the product owner? <laughs> and I said, okay, what does a product owner actually needs to do? And I think that was the starting point where um, I, I have actually moved from nursing care and nursing care towards a dialysis patient towards uh, creating something in terms of a software that is going to assist healthcare. You know, it could be the renal nurses, it could be the nephrologist, 
and it could be any anything else. I think that was that is not planned. And I think from this journey onwards, there will be a lot of unplanned. And we are just connecting the dots, or at least I'm actually connecting the dots from now on. What career goals do you have for the next five years? Wow. Um, you know, for the past um, 10 to 15 years, that was amazing. For the next five years, um, I think, first of all, for the company, for Reno Genie, it will be a lot of expansion and a lot of growth. Um, I think currently for the past, uh, I, th I would say that for the past five years, what we have done is that we, ha we are closing these gaps that we intend to in the practice of nursing or in the practice of a clinician. So I think for the next five years, I think with the advancement of uh, AI, nowadays we, we know that, right? That growth, that leap is exponential. And I, I don't think I'm the person who is able to talk about AI uh, confidently, but I'm very sure that with AI, uh, there are a lot of gaps that we can actually close, not only for nurses, not only in practice, in dialysis, but we can do a lot uh, for doctors, we could actually automate. We could actually uh, AI built into the Reno Genie, which is the, the software that, that we have. Uh, it could actually help to, to detect. It could actually uh, prompt uh, nurses and, and doctors the data that they could have missed, right? But I think in terms of AI, uh, they won't miss anything because it just go through trillions of uh, information and highlight uh, certain anomalies uh, to uh, the clinicians. So that is one thing uh, about um, the, the software itself and that would be part of my career. But on the other hand, it's also about myself, you know, how can I uh, lead a better team? I believe that the team will grow and it will grow exponentially because we intend to go global uh, with Reno Genie and of course together uh, with Anderson. I think the next, the next thing will be from Malaysia, where do we want to go? Um, Asia Pacific, can we go to Europe? Can we go to the United States? I think uh, the world will be our playground. I think that's a little bit um, uh, very, very much uh, exciting for myself and, and the team over here. Jamie, has your nursing experience been beneficial for your career? If so, in what ways? As a nurse, you took care of seriously ill patients. Is this experience of any relevance for you as manager and director? Oh, yes. Um, I think as a as an as a nurse, when we practice, um, we do we empathize, or you know, we are trained to empathize, or it is built in within me. So basically, I pity and I and I feel how the other person feels. So that is the nursing part of me. But then as I, as I grow in my career, I begin to lead a team, I become nurse managers and then I become, you know, having the opportunity to also become uh, the director of a company and now um, into IT. So to be able to empathise and also as a nurse, whether you're a junior or a senior, we have to continuously problem solve I think, uh, you, know, you know, sometimes when a patient collapses in front of you, you just got to problem solve continuously together with a team of doctors to res resuscitate and etc. So that uh, age, I think I have actually taken that part of my experience and then put them, put them in when I run a, a company, when I speak to my team, when I do the project, and I, when I become the product owner. Uh, so, so just to elaborate a little bit more. So as a nurse, I do that. But from a product owner point of view, um, I think the exciting thing is that 
I know what's going on at uh, a facility, particularly in a dialysis facility. And then on the other hand is how do we create a product that meets the needs or to close the gaps uh, or help to solve some problem or some workflow issues within a facility that are handled by nurses and doctors. And at the same time, having in mind how will that resolve a patient's problem. So eventually it all comes into you know, a big uh, 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 circle. But I think my basic training in uh, my profession has actually helped me to be grounded, efficient, solve problems as we go along, and also to work with a very diverse team. I would never have changed it for anything. How has the coronavirus pandemic changed patient care in Asia? Those who need to undergo hemodialysis cannot avoid this treatment. How has the COVID-19 pandemic affected your work? And have there emerged more digital healthcare solutions? I think during the pandemic, um, you know, the pandemic hit us, I think, without us being prepared for it. I think that was back in um, year 2020, right? When I, I remember that um, when it hit us, we didn't know how devastating it can be. Yeah, I mean, I, I could recall that because at that point of time, I'm still very much involved in uh, uh, treating patients, nursing patients. Um, not actively, but there were a few uh, centres that were under my care. And when it started, it wasn't that serious until I think when we went into quarantine, whereby patients are very ill. At that point of time, I think throughout the first year, we lose 30% of our patients. And that was really sad because our patients are chronically ill and doctors who are supposed to come to the facility for visits, they can't do so because of a quarantine. And as you know, um, I'm, I'm speaking from a Malaysia perspective. So our centres are at three states. Um, basically, I'm from the headquarters. The centres are literally far away from us and nobody could travel anywhere. It is very devastating. But at the same time, because we have, um, we have our software and somehow we are still connected, but we are connected digitally. So the patients who can't obtain that physical care right, from, uh, from the doctor, of course the nurses are still there, there are just too many rules, <laughs> you got to wear masks, uh, a lot of things that is actually going on in the facility. But the doctors can't go there and, um, and, and treat that patient, right? unless if the patient is very ill, then they have to then go into a hospital to be admitted to the hospitals. So how did we, using software, you know, technology, and how did we advance? We could actually use the software. The doctor could actually review patients, you know, through their dialysis uh, data, their hemodialysis prescription, and etc. Lab tests, they could actually view that digitally. But what we did was we did something uh, additional, whereby they could actually go on a video call with the doctor, and the doctor could view, could still cite them, right? And then do the necessary prescriptions for our uh, patients. I think with pandemic, I shouldn't say it this way, but I think with pandemic, it actually pushes us way, uh, way much faster towards a development of uh, technology, software, connectivity, because I think that uh, prior to pandemic, nobody or very less people are interested in uh, virtual calls and etc. I think to have this conversation with you may not even take place, right? But with pandemic, and yes, we go through quite uh, a lot of unforeseen circumstances. But at the end of the day, with pandemic, it actually drives a lot of digital advancement and digital change. And I can tell you that even my patients, our patients who are with us, 
they are amazing, I tell you. They, they could, they, you know, they are so comfortable with digital. I think most of them, most of them, not the elderly ones. But you'll be amazed <laughs> how some of these uh, elderly patients, whereby they, they, they have to go through certain practices when they come to the center, they have to weigh themselves, right? We, we created something very, very fancy for them. The fancy thing is when they, uh, for a dialysis patient, just, just to tell you a little bit more, yeah, Elena? Just in case that if you, uh, if, if you are not sure that a, a dialysis patients, they come for uh, dialysis and they have to weigh themselves. There is a pre-dialysis weight and then they go for their four hours of treatment and then at the end of the treatment, they have to weigh themselves again. So what we have developed is that uh, uh, to address certain issues of these patients. So patients are supposed to not to drink too much fluid. So like normal human being, we can drink a lot of water. We can drink coffee, soup, juices and etc. Dialysis patients, they, they can't. They just can't do so. And uh, the way bef before and after is actually for us to determine how much water did they lost during dialysis. And some patients, you know, they are, they are pretty naughty. <laughs> they are the naughty ones. <laughs> so with technology, what we have discovered is that uh, at the weighing scale, if we were to allow them to know how much fluid have they lost and whether did they achieve their goal by even a, a mere smiley, right? Congratulations, you have achieved your dry weight for today. It brings joy to them. And most of the patients treat these, you know, uh, 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 part of the technology that we have actually put into uh, the software to actually cultivate, to let them know that, hey, you have actually a uh, achieve something towards the end of the dialysis. And I've actually noticed this when some of our patients, uh, this is when we were doing an installation in one of the centre. And after the installation, I was a bit nervous because I'm not sure whether is it going to be well received by the patient. So these patients after dialysis, they were, they were actually queuing uh, to weigh after dialysis and and I can remember this clearly this this two patient who are standing uh, this one patient who is standing behind the first patient weigh himself and after weighing he actually has a the screen actually has a pop-up smiley and say congratulations you achieved your dry weight right so the patient was very happy and I said that wow okay we achieved something right and then the second patients who went onto the weighing scale didn't get that smiley you know it, it prom a phase but it actually prom you can do better so the second patient what happened was he actually because I was standing near there and he asked why why can't I get that smiley that congratulates me, right? And then I said, well, you know what? I'm going to refer you to the nurse in charge and you go to talk to the nurse because they will counsel you on how to achieve that, right? So these exercises, through technology, we have also discovered that, you know, it actually motivates patients to improve uh, the, the compliance towards how much they can drink, how much, what food that they can, they can take and etc. So it becomes, um, you know, these are the positive impact of uh, technology. It can be software, uh, it could be just a pop-up icon, right? It is something very simple, but it's very, very impactful for that patient. I think that that, that, that resonates with me. It's, 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 it's joy. It is actually pure joy, although it's just as simple as post-dialysis weight. Well, you've already covered some points for my next question. But would it be right to say that technology helps to improve communication with patients rather than hinders it? Um, I would say it helps. Uh, it helps. It helps a lot. And it helps us to... There are certain patients, I, I can tell you that uh, it, it, it depends on the age of the patients because renal failure happens um, not at an old age. 
You know, if we, if we were to currently look at our current uh, patient demographic, it, uh, a patient could actually have renal failure, a person, sorry, a, pa a person could have renal failure at a very young age. I mean, those days when I was in the hospital, I think my youngest patient was nine year old, a nine year old boy. Yeah, to as far as I can remember, my oldest patient is an 87 year old grandmother that uh, uh, that we managed to provide her to live an additional five years in his in her lifetime. Right. Um, so does it improve communication? Yes, definitely. But somehow technology helps us to present it in a way, because if we were to look at um, let, let's take an example that if it is a, a center that that documents everything on paper, right? So j just imagine that you're trying to present paper to the patients, right? There, there has to be a lot of work that needs to put into it. So that is, that is one thing. And then uh, um, transcribing data onto, let's say, an Excel sheet and an Excel sheet, then you print it out. Oh, that's a hell lot of work, right? Uh, but then if it is in terms of technology, in terms of software, right, it is presented in a way or perhaps it can be also into um, a patient application whereby we don't only get the patient involved, we get the family involved. Because the unique thing about dialysis is that it doesn't go away. You know, a patient who has kidney failure, the sickness doesn't go away it progress and it just grow. <laughs> I, I use the word grow with that person so long that that person is alive, right? So there are patients who, are, who have been dialyzing for 10, 15, 20 years if they dialyze well, right? So as it grows with the patient, it actually needs to provide that patient with some form of information. So to me, that is a definition of uh, improving communication, right? And also providing information to the family members because they do need a lot of support from the family because it is, it is holistic. Um, what does it mean? It means that um, it's, it's not even patient can't drink a lot of uh, fluid. The patient can't or not able to eat certain kind of food at home, right? So take an example that if this patient is at home, um, she's not able to prepare her food and let's say somebody else prepare the food for her, right? So this somebody else who is at home will need to know, hey, what can I, what can this person eat? what can I add in, what I need to exclude, and etc. So with uh, software, with digitalization, with technology, with technology, it needs to bring this knowledge not only to the patients, but to the family. And it is also a, a very good point of reference. You know, I, I have a lot of story to tell, so let me, tell, uh, let me share with you these other stories. When, 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 when I was, when I was practicing, when I was practicing, you know, some of the patients are very close with us because we literally see them uh, three times a day. We spend each session that is about four hours. And in a week, we spend about 12 hours to 15 hours with patients, right? And, and, and I think I spend more time with my patients than I spend more time with my mom, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> so so when, when, um, when we are spending uh, this, this time with patients and, that, at, and at that stage, they don't have certain technology. So what happened is that patient will call us up uh, because we do share our contact with our patients. And what happened is that before they attend, you know, before they go for dinner uh, or when they are at a queue queuing up to buy food, this is what they do. They will take a snapshot of what they intend to buy and then they will send it to us and say, can I eat this? <laughs> is it safe to eat? <laughs> that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's what they do. But I think in terms of coming back, coming back to our, our questions whereby uh, 
does technology help to bridge communication? I think yes, and I believe uh, we can do much better. We can do more and we can do much better. Yeah. Jamie, in your opinion, how will your field of activity, in particular hemodialysis, change in the next three to five years? Will these changes be related to digital technologies? Oh yes, definitely. I, I, uh, let's talk about two, I think th there are two contexts over here. First will be the hemodialysis or dialysis itself and then the next thing will be uh, technology. Although, although this both, um, we could, um, we can discuss it together. So firstly, it will be the technology, the dialysis. For example, uh, dialysis, I, I, I hope that one day dialysis can be made more pleasant to patients. Um, we hope that these changes can happen because I think in the field of dialysis, um, you, you may or may not know, it, during a dialysis, um, the blood actually passed through an artificial kidney that we call a dialyzer. That, that is where a lot of you know, filtration, removal of uh, body waste uh, and etc. That, that actually happens uh, during dialysis. And I think as we move forward, there are companies who are coming up with very much more efficient uh, dialyzer Right. There is a particular company that came up uh, with such an amazing dialyzer and that this dialyzer almost mimic uh, our kidney. It doesn't replace the kidney, but it mimics, it gives better clearance and etc. But the downside is it's very expensive. All right. So I think with technology, with this advancement, we hope that better dialyzers, better, better, better fiber. That's the content of the dialyzers. We could, it could be used to, to, to improve, but companies like that, they need to make it more affordable. I think that is one part. In terms of technology, you understand that dialysis needs dialysis machines, right? So uh, from that context, I think because of the dialysis machines, it's, it's each, it is huge and clunky if you, if you have seen it. It's, it's not too big, right? But it is, you know, it is a reasonable size, right? And uh, a, a patient can choose to own it uh, at home. But when you choose to own it at home, what happens is that you need water filtration. So because water needs to be treated. Right before it actually goes into the dialysis machine, before uh, it goes into the dialyzer, it mixes with um, some concentrates and then it becomes a uh, dialysate. Right? And I think uh, it may not be happening to, to, to this part of the world, but in certain parts of the world, a lot of patients will be undergoing home hemodialysis. For example, in the United States, uh, home hemo is prevalent. You know, it, it, it's, it's norm over there. But in our country, it is uh, in-center hemodialysis because of affordability, right? So the next thing that the person, uh, uh, the, the advancement for in terms of dialysis will be can then all these machines, can it be made into much more compact size and then therefore the patient could then perform their dialysis uh, at home, in a home environment because this is a long-term commitment. Once a patient has kidney failure, they have to be committed for hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis but today we're going to talk about uh, hemodialysis so how can in terms of um, improvement in the next three to five years or even the next 10 years right can there be like a portable machine you know like a knapsack that we we carry along with us that could be in the possible future so that is one of that but then as we know as dialysis progresses, so that is one part, right? The other part will be technology. Now, how do we get this data? All right, somebody has to be, somebody needs to document this data somewhere, 
right? Do we expect the patients to document this data? Because in centre, uh, once a centre is digitalised, that means they do not use paper and pen, it's digitalised, the data is being uh, stored in a system whereby nurses, uh, doctors, clinicians, dietitians, they could review it review this data and then improve that care, prescribe uh, um, changes in hemodialysis and etc. Right? So first thing would be where can we retrieve this data, where do we store it and I think uh, in the next three to five years if we close this uh, gap that we have in terms of uh, data from the hemodialysis machine arriving to landing onto a particular platform whereby it could be reviewed by clinicians and not only nephrologists because sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time uh, a, a patient with uh, end-stage renal failure sometimes is, they don't only have problem with, with their kidneys they have problem literally everywhere <laughs> because they could be a diabetic Right, uh, they may have a uh, problem with their eyesight, they may have a problem with their hearts and etc. So all this information needs to be viewed and reviewed by uh, uh, various uh, specialists uh, in, 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 in that sense. So therefore, I think in the next three to five years, uh, there will be a lot of advancement and again, I think AI would definitely play one of its major role. I understand there are regulatories, there are compliance and it, that we need to comply with, but AI is definitely um, will be part of this journey because I think as clinicians, we miss out things. We do. Right? But with AI, it actually helps to highlight what we miss and with that, we can improve patients' care and patients' well-being. Well, we already talked about technologies in healthcare, but what role does technology play in your life? How does it impact your daily routine? You know, many people outside your region think that Asians are living in a sort of science fiction movie, being constantly online via 6G or something. How close is this notion to reality? I'm in Malaysia, I stay in the capital city of Kuala Lumpur. We have uh, the privilege right, to, to, to enjoy 5G, uh, but I think it, it depends on uh, geographically where we are, certain capital cities, we, we have this luxury, but as we move away from capital city, uh, I think the 5G will reduce to 4, 3, 2, and it just goes lower, right? But in terms of myself, uh, technology, um, I have this uh, friend of mine which is called smartphone. <laughs> I think all of us, uh, it is attached to me all the time, so now I'm actually sitting far away <laughs> from this smartphone of mine. Uh, it, it, it actually helps me to keep uh, many things into perspective. Can't live without my Google Calendar. It keeps my timetable in place. In terms of technology, I do uh, wear uh, smart watches. It, it monitors how you know how I'm doing. Am I getting stressed out? Am I getting enough uh, steps? Uh, do I get enough sleeps? How how are the quality of my sleeps? And and I I do believe I you know I'm I'm very uh, I'm very detailed at looking at these per, uh, data's right. Why? Because I think um, you know that, that I I think the ingrain of a product owner in me. I think constantly about what I do, what technology can do for me, and then how can I then take that and then translate that into patient care, and also how can that translate into you know helping nurses, uh, getting doctors to 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 have better monitoring system and etc. And I know that is uh, a long way. We have a long way to go, 
right? There will be a lot of collaboration that we that, that we we require to undertake. It's not only you and I, Elena. <laughs> I think it is with uh, various. Uh, I think r regulators, partners, and etc. Right, but I think um, I love technology. Um, I wear them. I use them. I look at the data. Um, I love AI. I use uh, uh, AI tools in many ways. And how can we then implement that? Uh, talk to my development team and say, that, can we put this? Can we just put this in? I think that's how uh, animated I am. And, 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 and I enjoy technology. Really, I, I do. It's, it's, it's with me all the time. But, but there are times that you know, I, just, I just want to put it away. Just, just put it aside. For example, uh, I run and I hike. I, I do, I, I love to hike. And um, I think last year when I hiked, hiked Mount Kinabalu, I, I had my smartwatch with me because I wanted to know uh, how far did I go, how fast did I go, right? But the rest of it is, I don't have any connectivity, so I can't do anything else, all right? But to just, okay, I, I trust my guide and just enjoy the environment. So at the end of the day is for that, I think two days, it was two days and one night. So that, that, that particular hike, the only technology that I have with me is actually my smartwatch that tells me where I am, where I'm going. Um, and, 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 and that's it. I think at, for that two days, uh, I kind of switch off, no emails, nothing, right? Which is, I think it is very nourishing for the soul, for a person, you know, <laughs> who, is, who is into technology, that is very nourishing for the soul. <laughs> but other than that, other than that, it's always, uh, I have some technology that is with me um, all the time. I operate in several sites. How do you manage to stay informed about everything happening in your clinics? What do you do to monitor workflows? Do you use any specific tech solutions such as CRM systems, messengers or anything else? Would you rather trust your colleagues rather than control them? It is a mixture. It is all of that that you have mentioned. So firstly, I think, um, I think running centres remotely because you, you can't be there. You, I can't be there uh, in three or five or ten centres at one go. Firstly, most importantly, is I need to trust my team, right? Um, I have to empower them that they have certain empowerment, they, can, they have certain authority that they can carry out and anything that they are not sure of they can reach out to me anytime. So that is one. Secondly, it's definitely software in this perspective. It is Reno Genie, right? But coming back to the Google Calendar, right? So um, I, I would say that um, I have frequent calls with them. So either it is going to be, if the center is very new, then that can be several times a week or sometimes if it is very new, it can be several times a day. I can be that detailed uh, into handling a uh, centre's issue. But otherwise, if the centre is, is, is ongoing, meaning uh, patients are stable and etc., we usually go on a monthly call. So there will be a monthly meeting, it can be a virtual meeting with the nurse managers and etc. So, so that will be one session. But I do visit, um, I do visit them as I go to the centres, go and meet up with the nurses, that will be every two months to every three months. At the beginning, it's always very frequent, right? But once we have developed an understanding, right? and once I have trust my uh, managers, and they then work well with the doctors and nephrologists, and then they, the, the feedback loop that comes back to me, and then when I look into the software, because it is anywhere, it is cloud-based, once I look into it, patients are doing very well, uh, patients' feedback are all right, then that trip will become definitely uh, very much lesser. 
But I think most importantly is technology is one thing, but being you know when you lead when you lead a team, it is it is very important that number one we need to trust the team. We need to trust the managers and nurses that they can carry out uh, that those responsibility, and if they can't do so, the person you know they can reach out to to me at any time. And why do I keep uh, mentioning nurses and, and not uh, doctors is because in um, I think in, in, in Malaysia in this part in this part of the world quite different than uh, the United States because we have satellite centers so satellite centers are standalone centers so standalone centers doesn't have a full-time doctor that is based within a dialysis facility right and the nurses uh, takes on um, a very huge role, right, in terms of caring for the patients, uh, along with a lot of decision makings, and then uh, the doctors will review the patient in a periodic manner that is uh, that is governed by the regulatory, right. So therefore, the the nurses, the nurse managers are highly trained, and they need to make that decision. So for me. Uh, I think my method of working with my team is number one, I trust them and they will know that I trust them. And then secondly is if they have any issue that they can't solve, they need to get in touch with me in which I'm contactable. Um, and at the same time, uh, I will then check on them, <laughs> you know, through software and etc. So that's how I kind of monitor them uh, digitally. No doubt that chemodialysis nature is very demanding. For many years, you've been providing care for chronic patients with end-stage renal disease. The majority of them will rely on your treatment for the rest of their lives. Relatively few of your patients can avoid chemodialysis for a kidney transplantation, for example. How do you manage to avoid burnout in such an emotionally taxing role? What motivates you most of all? The desire to help people or something else? Um, in terms of uh, in terms of burnout, um, it is it is mainly on uh, the intention to help people. I think because of my because of of my background, uh, I think helping people uh, in terms of a uh, let's take an example of a of a dialysis patient. It is. It is really important because at the end of the day, is that whatever that we we do, we actually enable these patients who has been ongoing uh, dialysis, whether they started dialysis or they have been ongoing dialysis for a period of time. We see them uh, progress to be better. Most of the time, we want them to progress uh, to be better and to enable them to not to be cured but actually to allow them to live another five ten years 15 years for example i think that um, gives me the ability to to continue to provide this service uh, and not to feel uh, burnt out um, let me give you let me give you an example. Um, when we many years back, so let's let's take uh, ten years ten years back. Let's say in twenty, I think when we started one of the big center in in twenty, I think twenty fourteen, twenty fourteen, in one of the uh, big large center in in East Malaysia. We we wanted to start this center is because um, because I wanted to relate how do you know what we what we contribute what I contribute and because of that it actually helps me to alleviate it, it, I feel fulfilled instead of burnout. So the story began with in twenty fourteen uh, the business owner. Uh, then was Rina team wanted to set up centers and 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 in in Malaysia we have a very unique way of setting up centers because we need 
um, we need approval yeah, from the Ministry of Health. And because of the complexity to set up, we decided that, okay, we set up a center in East Malaysia, and which is logistically, it is a challenge. But why did we choose that center was because uh, it, within that state, there, there is only one hospital. And this hospital provided dialysis for all its patients within that district. And because lack of, um, lack of availability, yeah, just let me put it this way, lack of availability of uh, machines and resources. So therefore, we thought that by us, uh, from a private, uh, private establishment, set up a hemodialysis center over there, could provide many things. Number one, we provide uh, dialysis for patients. It's not only for the needy patients, for the patients that can afford it. And also we provide, and then we realize that, or at least I, I realized that we provide employment because uh, there, there were a lot of nurses that were trained and when they returned to uh, East Malaysia, that particular country called Sabah, uh, they don't have employment, so therefore they can't practice uh, as nurses. So what they do is they, they go into farming. You know, can you imagine nurses that many years of uh, training and study and they go back to their country and they become a farmer? Or they work in a provision uh, shop besides nursing. They don't practice nursing. Um, so by doing so, when we started, we, had, uh, we set out the centre. We had uh, six machines, and then from six machines, it grows to uh, 12 machines. And of course, we put in the software, we could, remote, we could remotely monitor you know, from the patients, we, we collaborate, collaborate with doctors, and, and, and etc. But with that, we, at least from my perspective, is that we have given, we hope that we have, you know, for that, between that 10 years, we have given additional um, life because we have years of living to those patients who uh, require dialysis. All right. Otherwise, they may not have uh, obtained those treatments because they, they may need to travel 60 to 100 kilometers to go for a treatment and then they need to travel another 60 to 100 kilometers to go back home and they need to repeatedly, repeatedly do that three times a week and for the rest of their life right so I think you know with that with that, and also with uh, when, when we have when we have uh, our patient day, I still remember that that was I think after a year that was right before pandemic we had our patients day, and the patient actually came back to uh, came to us, and our theme uh, during that patient day was a celebration of life. Why we say a celebration of life is because. You know, when, when we provide this treatment for them, we're just able to perhaps just give them an, an additional couple of more years, right? So that is one. But on the other hand, it is also, you know, providing job opportunity, training opportunity uh, to, to nurses, to, the, um, to even the housekeepers, to the front desk admin, you know, to be able to work with, uh, to be work, to be able to work with us, to be able to experience not only um, you know the classic way of running a dialysis, but to also know that hey, uh, with a dialysis you have software who can support this and etc. So I think that that is that that you know with that um, with that feeling, with that desire, that actually prevent, I think, helps me, yeah, helps me not to have that burnout, <laughs> not to feel burnout, because I think I am doing and my team, we are all doing something that is very beneficial, right?
it may sound quite cliche for a person who, who hear this, but honestly, uh, uh, Elena, we, we have been working together for, for, for some time, right? Do I feel burnout sometimes? <laughs> I do, because um, I, I work long hours, uh, long days. Sometimes there's just no end to decision making. There are, the, there are just problems after problems after problems and etc. Right? And, and how do I, and I can't take long breaks. To be, no, honestly, I can't take long breaks, right? But then how can I then manage this? I think in one way or another is uh, like us today, right? Uh, I, I, I think I spend perhaps half a day or a full day in a beautiful studio like this, right? It is, uh, it is time off for me, you know? And I, I don't have that gadget with me, you know, my, my friendly uh, uh, smartphone is not anywhere near me. So nobody can... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can tell me to solve problem now, <laughs> right? But to to literally be here and to to have this conversation uh, um, with you. So in many ways, these are these are short breaks. Uh, you know, short breaks uh, for me. That I think that helps me. That this this kind of thing works for me. Short breaks uh, in between take me away from uh, the feeling of burnout. But I must say, I must also add to my team members, right? Um, they do give me space and, and I do tell them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not shy about telling uh, to my team members, you know, to tell them that, guys, I, I need a break. Just give me a few, just a few hours, okay? Just don't give me any problem. <laughs> Yeah. So, so that is that is how, from my perspective, that's how I handle, you know, not going to that route of burnout. If I feel it, I have to, I have to navigate myself uh, uh, away from 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 them from from that, the word burnout. So, literally speaking, you do not accumulate this burnout feeling and try to avoid having it, right? Yes, I'm being very mindful. I, I, I am mindful uh, when I begin to feel burnout. I, I do show symptoms. I know it. You know, I, I'm a little bit short temper and I take effort in controlling my temper. I could have snapped at somebody, right? I know that, okay, I need that few hours of, uh, a few hours of break. Mm, therefore, I love Sunday. I love uh, long runs. Long runs meaning, you know, it can be 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. I could just run and run slowly and being uh, mindful. Um, and, and, and sometimes uh, I, 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 I try to recall this, this, this quote. Um, there is this quote uh, by Mah uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Right. I, I remember, this quote resonates with me is because our beliefs, um, it will lead, it will bring us to our thoughts, right? So belief will lead to thoughts and these thoughts will then lead to words. Then from words, right, it then becomes an action. And then from actions, it becomes habits. And then from habits, it becomes our destiny, right? So my perspective of uh, um, these quotes is that I am mindful with what I think about. I really try not to put in any negativity that is going to bring me to the route of burnout or, or nothing that is desirable, right? So I'm very careful with uh, the beliefs, the thoughts, the words that I say to people, to my team members and etc. And then I hope that with, with, you know, with, with these practices, our destiny, there is always this ultimate destiny that I share with you in uh, three years time, five years, maybe not in my lifetime, Right, what we can, 
you know what we can do, what we can do with um, the software that we are developing and how else we can contribute. But I think it always starts off with that belief. So my belief is I do not want to get burned out. I want to be this way, um, a sustainable way so that I can we can, you know, I can continue to, to, to progress and to be this uh, better person. Jamie, can you mention some unique requirements for digital chemodialysis solutions within the Asian region? Is it true that power outages, internet disruptions and certain peculiarities of care delivery pose big challenges? It depends on where we are, I think, uh, which state where we are. I think in, if we were to talk about um, technology and if we were to talk about where the uh, the, the uh, dialysis center is, is 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 set up it is vulnerable to to all those causes that you have mentioned right uh, and we can't predict we, we are unable to predict it um, I give you an example um, dialysis centers what is required to run a dialysis facility you need electricity. Then you need um, a, a water treatment system. We call it a RO system, the reverse osmosis system, right? And then you need the dialysis, the dialysis machines. And then if you have software, you need the software, all right? Then you need nurses and etc. And if we were to look at, uh, if we take a step back and then we look at the current weather conditions. The current weather condition is so unpredictable. When it's supposed to be hot, it is cold, or it is extremely hot, right? And that that could do because of that hot to cold typhoon and etc. It causes no electricity, so uh, power outage. So when there is power outage that happens not very regularly in the city area, but I think it does affect uh, certain rural areas, right? And then in rural areas, there will be rain and then it floods, right? Then again, it's going to affect um, the dialysis itself because when there is no electricity, uh, no water supply, it affects uh, um, uh, dialysis. So these are the main factors that we may or may not be able to, to control unless everybody, every one of us just work towards certain thing, you know, how do we, um, how do we, whatever that we do, what is it that, that is going to harm uh, the world, that is going to translate into um, climate changes. But on the other hand, there is also things like uh, affordability. So um, one of the uniqueness about uh, dialysis, and if we want to go into the, the route of digitalization or having some form of a software is number one, uh, it must be affordable, right? It can't cost an arm uh, or, or a leg for a center to, to pay for it. And secondly, it is in the context of uh, Malaysia, we have so many uh, funding organizations. Uh, what does it mean? It means that uh, um, insurance or governments or government organizations that fund for patients dialysis. And then what does it mean? It means that, you know, some some funding organization may be funding a uh, hundred ringgit and then some other funding organization may be funding a uh, 50 ringgit in total. So the various different kind of uh, forms, the various and different kind of logics, a person have to take that into consideration and the uniqueness of us, uh, at least in Malaysia. Jamie, last but not least, since you're working in both such a challenging and innovative world of digital healthcare, what would your advice be to those who share your life philosophy in enhancing patient care and have just started exploring the complicated journey of product ownership? You know, let, let me tell you this story. A couple of years, couple of years back, uh, you know, from, from, 
from what I do and I transit to become uh, a, a product owner into technology, right? Now, every single words that come out from me sounds technology. <laughs> uh, I, when I started this uh, transition, when I began to exceed um, the practice into technology, there will be a lot of people, especially the people who are closest to you or the people that you work with, right? They will tell you that you are crazy. I have people who have told me that, Jamie, have you gone out of your mind? <laughs> <laughs> that you decided to make this uh, change, right? But uh, what I would say will be, I, I think firstly, you, that person who wants to make this decision or at, let me recall that moment is, I believe I can. And I believe that people or the team that I work with are able to support me as I grow. And generally, I'm a very curious person. I will ask any kind of questions. I am not shy to ask any questions, right? So personally, I believe. Um, secondly, is support from the team members. Those people who say, no, I don't think you can make it. Oh, it's all, you know, it's all right. But, you know, the journey is on me. I'm the one who is going to undertake this journey. And I believe I can, right? And then thirdly, or thirdly becomes the most important. You know, once you have put away all that, the next thing will be, you gotta work very hard. <laughs> because you gotta work so hard because you basically, I, I do not understand anything and everything that is on technology. I, I you know, I have my training uh, in, in nursing. I practice that for so long. But at the same time, when we, when we journey into a different realm, which is the technology, all right? But what, what holds me is that, hey, I have this knowledge and this experience and this skill that I have learned throughout these 15, 20 years, right? That I can problem solve. How difficult can this be? The different will be the, the jargons, the technical jargons are different, but the problem solving methods, you know, it is almost the same, right? The different is you just, that person just need to put in the hours. They need to do the hard work. I think there is no shortcut to it. They just, they just can't say that, you know, uh, I, I can, uh, I do not want to do any extra work. I cherry pick on what I want to do if I want to make that transition. So my journey, it is a lot of hard work. <laughs> a lot of hard work. Don't burn out. Do something that you like. Run, hike. Be truthful to the team. I think the other thing is that my, I have this really candid conversation with my team. Every single time, when I sit in a meeting or to anybody that I, I do not know or, the same, uh, or, or somebody that I even interview, you know, uh, uh, meaning to my team, I will tell them that I am not technically trained. You know, I, don't, I do not know Python, Java, no, I do not know. You know, I learn the hard way and I ask a lot of questions. And until today, I don't code, you know, but uh, I, I think what I do is that I, from the experience that I have, I just have to put in the extra hours, uh, read. There are a lot of YouTubes, there are a lot of uh, tutorials, there are a lot of conversations like this that we can uh, learn a lot from. I think that will be uh, my take for whoever who wants to transit from you know, a clinician and who wants to dwell into um, the technology world or to become a product owner. Yeah. I even Google. I think the first time when somebody says that Jamie, you are the product owner, and I, I literally Google how to be a product owner. Thank you, Jamie, for all the positive energy and the insightful answers you shared with us today. I really look forward to meeting you at some of the major health tech events soon. Elena, thank you so much. Bye bye.
Both I and our guests have this wonderful opportunity to learn more about the hurdles to success in healthcare in Asia and get a clear perspective of technological advancements in the renal patient's care. Follow our YouTube channel for more insightful talks with our experts and health tech leaders.